for joining the webinar today. Today, it's Arma's privilege to host our speaker, Sydney Green. Sid is founder and president of Enhanced Production Incorporated and a research professor with the University of Utah. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering and a degree of engineer in applied mechanics from Stanford. He co-founded the TerraTech Rock Mechanics Testing Lab in Utah, which was later acquired by Schlumberger. He served in, on numerous advisory committees and in capacities for the U.S. National Research Council, the Department of Defense, the Department of Transportation, and was chair of the U.S. National Committee on Rock Mechanics. Sid is an Arma Fellow and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. For those of you just joining us, please mute your devices and type your questions into the chat window. We'll address those questions following his talk. Sid, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want to begin by noting my co-authors, Professor John McLennan at the University of Utah, Dr. Palaj Panji, University of Utah, Dr. Richard Ellis, retired head, Utah Geological Survey and adjunct professor at the University of Utah, Kevin Kritz, a consultant with much experience in the field of geothermal energy, Richard Newhart, who is retired vice president of Encana, and Dr. Joseph Moore, University of Utah. These people are really fine people, and they're much smarter than I am. And so if there's any difficult questions, uh, I'll blame it on transfer them to my co-authors. My presentation will be available. Uh, I'll send it to uh, Dr. Schultz, and you can, or you can just contact me, and I will send it to you. There are a number of references shown here that I'm summarizing today. They're available as noted with the exception of there's one that is in review for publication, but all the others are generally available as noted here on this slide. Now these references contain detail that I'm only gonna have time today to sort of mention. And I encourage anyone that would like to or more interested to download these and review them in detail. So these again were all available and, and I will share my slides. So you'll have both the slides and uh, this information. The subject today is uh, reservoir thermal energy storage. And really here, I'm gonna speak on subsurface hot water storage for future electricity generation. Now just to have everyone thinking the same, this is a schematic of the entire process. Hot water is stored in part of the deep underground reservoir. The hot water is produced to generate electricity and then the cooled water is heated and re-injected into, the, into uh, the reservoir or it may just be injected as cold into the cool part of the reservoir. Now when the sun is shining, the cooled water can be reheated and re-injected into the hot part of the reservoir or if not producing electricity, but when the sun is shining, cold water can simply be produced directly, heated on the surface and injected into the hot part of the reservoir to be stored for future electricity production. Or when the sun is shining, both electricity could be produced and water heated on the surface and injected at the same time if desired. So this is a schematic of how the overall process would work. The concept aims to use solar heat collectors for heat uh, to heat the hot water on the surface. This is a picture of a large parabolic, parabolic collector field uh, that I show just for illustration. Now I note that the surface components, the parabolic collectors, the geothermal power plant, are generally well understood. It's a storage reservoir that is least constrained. And that's the subject really of this presentation today. Making large scale and long-term reservoir thermal energy storage work, in my opinion, is all about the reservoir. The surface facilities are developed. It's a subsurface storage container that is the unknown. The background of this work that I'm talking about today started with the uh, National Science Foundation project called Said Heat, uh, headed by Dr. John Holbrook at Texas Christian University some years ago. 
said he considered sedimentary basins for possible geothermal heat sources. This led to considering sedimentary basin formations, not just for geothermal resource, but for heat storage. The Idaho National Laboratory with some of the authors here were also participating in that program, considered sedimentary basin calling the technique GOTs, that is G-E-O-T-E-S. The University of Utah with National Science Foundation support considered sedimentary basin formations and called the concept geothermal battery energy storage or just GB for short. That's what I'm speaking about today. Overall, the concept of storing warm or hot water in the subsurface is, of course, not new. What has received less attention is consideration of formations of high porosity, 10 to 15% or higher, high permeability, maybe 100 millidarcies, at about at depths of about one and a half kilometers to store hot water at 250 degrees centigrade or hotter. That's what I'm speaking about here now. In considering such formations as a storage container, three things have emerged from the previous work. First, the rock mass volume for storage for the storage container is very small. That is, rock with say 15% porosity can store water injected into a single well at 40 to 80 kilograms per second for eight hours while the sun shines, for example can store that in a radius of only 15 to 20 media, meters for a reservoir 100 meters thick. That means that the rock mass volume for the reservoir is really quite small. Second, the high permeability causes pressure disturbances to quickly equilibrate, possibly nearly with the speed of sound of water. That is when injecting or producing water, the flow will create a pressure variation in the reservoir. When injection production stops, the pressure quickly equilibrates back to the reservoir pressure. This rapid equilibration is also true for any gravity water movement caused by thermal variations that produce density change in the water. Thermal variations also equilibrate relatively quickly. The porosity created surface area contact that is a poor surface area contact between the, the water, hot or cold water, and the rock is huge and uniformly distributed through the porosity of the reservoir. Thus, thermal equilibrium between the rock and the water occurs relatively quickly because of this very large, poor rock water contact area. And third, the concept uses the reservoir poor water with no fresh water required, nor is any water stored on the surface. However, geochemistry issues are critical. Managing to prevent scaling or dissolution of the reservoir rock is absolutely essential. And this will limit to some extent the temperatures and pressures for production, heating and cooling and reinjection. Geochemistry issues are a major consideration but are not the subject of the short presentation here. Geochemistry issues are considered in one of the references mentioned on that second slide previously, the National Science Foundation sponsored workshop and the presentation by Dr. Joseph Moore. But again, this presentation today, I will not speak about geochemistry issues. I'm gonna draw on calculations performed by Dr. Panja. It's referenced on the second slide. Now, Dr. Penge has performed many calculations as presented in the references, which allow really the observations that I'm gonna speak about here now. There are many reservoir parameter variations to consider, including porosity, permeability, reservoir thickness, rock thermal conductivity and specific heat, injection rates, over and underlying formation thermal conductivities, injection production cycles, and others. There's simply too many parameters to eyeball, if you will, and guess at the interaction of one parameter on another. 
For example, one may think that lower porosity may be similar to less thickness of the reservoir. That is, from a conservation of mass, you'd say a lower porosity might be the same as just a thinner, uh, same as a thicker reservoir, and vice versa. But that's not quite true because the volume of rock matrix to the volume of water changes with porosity, but, but not with the reservoir thickness change. The change in viscosity of water with temperature is important. Expansion contraction of the pore water is important. Production and injection require different volumes if no water mass is to be added or subtracted from the reservoir. And other details simply require many parameter variations to be considered if you want to understand hot water storage deep in the subsurface. The calculation of Dr. Pandya have been essential to understand this reservoir storage container. The calculations here consider a single well shown in the slide with injection of hot water or production of the hot water occurring. In reality, one would need more than just one well since one would be producing cold reservoir water and heating on the surface then injecting at the same time. Thus, as a minimum, two wells would be required. Nevertheless, for these illustrative calculations, one well is considered, as shown in the slide, either injecting or producing. The reservoir is considered with over and underlying low permeability formations, as shown in the slide. And this is essential. Hot water at 250 degrees centigrade was injected at 40 kilograms per second along the entire height of the, for, uh, of the reservoir. For the calculations here, injection occurred for eight hours, followed by the same mass of water, not volume, but the same mass being produced over 10 hours, and then the well stabilized for six hours. And then this daily cycle was repeated over again. There are more variations presented in the references where we looked at other variations in the, in the injection, production, stabilizing cycles, and other things. But for the talks here, most of the presentation uh, speaks to, to the scenario I just mentioned. The upper left figure here shows the temperature versus radial distance from the injection well. The initial reservoir temperature is 120 degrees centigrade in these calculations. The temperature profiles are after injecting for eight hours for each of the daily cycles for injection, production, stabilization. So this is the temperature profiles after eight hours of injection and just before production starts. Temperature uh, profiles are shown for the first cycle and out to 100 cycles. After a few cycles, little change in the temperature profile is shown for each additional production, uh, each in additional injection, production, stabilization cycle. Elevated reservoir temperature only occur after about 20 meters radius for the injection well. Again, this is radial temperature variation just after injecting 250 degree centigrade water for eight hours at 40 kilograms per second. The figure on the lower right temperature are for the same calculations, but plotted not versus radius, but versus cycles, which is really versus time with each daily cycle a 24 hour time period. We see the temperatures rise above the initial reservoir temperature of 120 degrees centigrade, and they fall lower during the production from the same well. This lower right hand, lower right hand figure is the temperature at the well bore, just at the well bore. When production stops, temperature stabilizes quickly at the beginning of the six hour hold period, and then another cycle is started injecting again and so forth. The temperature version of cycles reach a near cyclic equilibrium after a few cycles. That is, after a few cycles, the rock matrix has been heated and the water, in an ideal sense, the same water, 
is produced from the hot water of the reservoir, cooled and reheated on the surface, and then re-injected with the rock matrix temperature changing relatively little for each cycle, except just at the hot water, cold water interface region. And I'll speak more about this when I speak of charging the reservoir before production begins. This slide shows the same calculations, but it shows the pressures instead of the temperatures. The upper left figure shows reservoir pressure at distance away from the injection well. This is at the end of injection, just before production begins for the first cycle out to 100 cycles. Little change in the pressure versus distance from the well bore occurs for the high permeability formation from cycle one to 100. The lower right figure shows again the same calculation, but it's the pressure just at the well bore versus cycles, where again, each cycle is a 24 hour day. This is effective pressure at the well bore versus time. During injection, the well bore pressure increases above the initial reservoir pressure of 12 megapascals to about 13 megapascals. During production, the well bore pressure draws down to below the reservoir initial pressure of 12 megapascals. At the end of production, the well bore pressure quickly equilibrates to the reservoir initial pressure of 12 megapascals. Very little change in cyclic well bore pressure occurs after a few cycles. The upper figure shows the pressure change during injection extends out to about 100 meters from the well bore. While if you recall on the other, the previous slide, the temperature change extends only about 20 meters from the well bore. Again, these are the pressures and temperature profiles just at the end of injection before we start production and at the end of production just before we start stabilizing the stabilizing period. Now there's much more detail in the references from the calculations of Dr. Pena to show these are just a few for illustration. Now in actual operation, one would likely want to thermally charge the reservoir before beginning production. This figure shows a case where the reservoir has been charged for 120 days. We've injected 250 degrees centigrade water for eight hours at 40 kilograms per second each day, which might be visualized as eight hours when the sun shines. And the reservoir temperature rise has now extended out to about 40 meters radius, again, after recharging for 120 days with no production. Production may now begin and produce water will be at nearly the charging temperature of 250 degrees centigrade for some time before cooler water would be produced. That depends, of course, on the production volume. Producing an adequate recharging cycles could maintain the hot water part of the reservoir hot. Such, thermal, such thermally charging the reservoir not only allows production of 250 degrees centigrade temperature, as in this illustration, but also provides for the hot part of the reservoir staying hot. And thus we do not cycle high to low to high temperature for each cycle in the hot part of the reservoir. Thermally charging the reservoir, maintaining a charge essentially creates a high temperature geothermal reservoir, which can be produced just as any high temperature reservoir. There's one other consideration I'm gonna note from these calculations, and that is the percent of the injected heat that can be recovered. Now this does not include pumping or parasitic charger, but this simply is looking at the heat recovered from our cycle scenario of injecting, producing, stabilizing. This is a percent of the heat in, uh, that can be recovered for these cycles. The slide shows cumulative heat loss and loss per cycle as a percent of the injected heat. This is for daily cycles, injecting again eight hours, 10 hours, and stabilizing for six hours. 
for early cycles, large amount of heat is not recovered, which occurs as the rock matrix is being heated. However, after 100 cycles, heat loss, again, for this particular cyclic case, approaches about 5% of the loss per cycle and continues to decline slightly. The heat that can be practically recovered is really important. Unless a large part of the heat injection can be practically recovered, heat storage just isn't going to be economical. There simply isn't enough energy in a barrel of hot water to make storage and recovery economical unless nearly all the heat put in the earth can be practically recovered. This is probably the really big observation presented here from this work. Let me proceed from the calculation observation to show one concept for Wells layout for a possible real system. I noted earlier that for any real system that more than one well would be required. That is for a real system, cold water must be produced, heated on the surface and injected at the same time when the sun is shining. And it is desirable to produce hot water to generate electricity anytime whether the sun is shining or not. The slide shows what is called a unit geothermal battery system that uses a number of slim holes, small diameter wells, and a single large production well for electricity generation. The wells are designed to be either hot wells or cold wells, not hot sometimes and cold sometimes, thereby somewhat simplifying completions required. There are four slim hole wells in what would always be the cold part of the reservoir. There are four slim hole wells in what would always be the hot part of the reservoir. And there is one large hot producing well aimed to be in about the center of the hot water reservoir storage container. Now this is a lot of wells to drill. However, the eight slim hole wells would drill in a couple days each in a sedimentary basin to one and a half kilometer depths, depending on the overlying formations. The eight slim hole wells could be reduced to only two cold wells and two hot injection wells, for example, of somewhat larger diameter, or other combinations of cold and hot wells could be made depending on the drilling and completion costs. The large diameter hot production well will require longer time to drill and complete, of course. Now, this is the illustration of what a unit may look like. And this is just one concept for a unit. Such a unit like this may produce of the order of 10 megawatts when producing electricity. So 10 such units would be required for a 100 megawatt plant, for example. As noted, this presentation is about the reservoir. And so I'm not going to speak any more about the surface facilities. However, the NSF workshop, which is referenced in the second slide, has a great presentation by Kevin Pritz on the surface facilities. As I near the end of my presentation, I will make brief comments on several issues shown here. For more detail on each, the reference cited at the top of the slide is available on the website noted and could be downloaded if desired. That reference contains more detail regarding each of the issues, more detail than I can present in the short presentation this morning. But let me comment on these seven items. First, why can we say heat is in the water? Initially, the injected hot water displaces a cold reservoir of pore water to create a high temperature reservoir. The hot water must heat the rock matrix, and initially most of the injected heat is consumed to heat the rock matrix. Once the rock matrix is heated, that is the reservoir is thermally charged as I spoke of briefly, then hot water can be produced, new hot water injected, and the rock matrix in the hot part of the reservoir stays hot. Recalling the previous slide, there is a boundary zone between the hot reservoir and cold reservoir. The boundary moves inward, and outward with production and injection, but the rock matrix in the thermally charged hot part of the reservoir stays hot. 
the heat put in and the heat put taken out are in the water. Thus, one can say the heat is in the water. Again, after the reservoir is thermally charged. Second, what about natural fractures and faults? Indeed, fractures and faults could lead to large fluid flow away from the desired reservoir, possibly even to the surface leading to a major steam explosion. Because the rock mass volume is small, for the illustration here, tens of meters in dimension, or kil not kilometers, the storage container that one can select could be expected to be away from natural fractures and faults. This is important, and again, the small rock mass volume required for substantial hot water storage adds confidence that proper reservoir storage containers away from fractures and faults would exist. Third, because sedimentary basin depositional environments may lead to non-isotropic, non-homogeneous permeability formations, how would this affect the storage container? This has been investigated in the reference cited on the second slide. Many calculations were performed by Dr. Pandya considering anisotropic and non-homogeneous permeability rocks. Flood flow and thermal response will obviously not be radially symmetric, but will be moved towards the ellipsoidal shaped pressure and temperature profiles from the wellbore, depending on the anisotropy and non-homogeneity of the permeability. Calculations suggest that even for significant variability of permeabilities, the effects are important to take into account but they do not reduce the heat recovery efficiency much. The reference cited contains the detailed calculations. Fourth, what is the source of the heat loss? That is the non-recoverable injected heat. Non-recoverable heat after the reservoir is thermally charged is primarily the heat loss in the over and underlying formations. These formations must be low permeability thereby preventing heat transfer by convection. Heat transfer by conduction is low because of the low conduct, thermal conductivity of rock. Calculations were made by Dr. Pangy considering different rock conductivities, and the heat loss is shown in the illustration about 5% per cycle for the daily cycle scenario after 100 cycles. Fifth, why is pressure equilibration so important? Just to clarify, I'm speaking now of pressure equilibration that occurs after injection or production stops. During injection and production, the fluid flow creates pressure gradients in the reservoir. When injection or production stops, the reservoir pressure tend toward the far field uniform pore pressure. This is the pressure equalization that I speak of here. Because of the high permeability, the equilibration occurs very quickly. Correspondingly, when pressure equilibration occurs, fluid movements have stopped. As I noted earlier, thermal equilibrations also occur quickly. Because of the rock matrix large pore surface area that is homogeneously distributed. This large pore surface area allows rapid conductivity to equilibrate the rock and water temperature. There are more details shown in the calculations regarding fluid movement caused by gravity or water density versus temperature change. These are addressed in the reference noted at the top of the slide. Rapid equilibration of pressure and temperature is an important positive result of high porosity and high permeability. These tend to reduce any thermal stratification within the reservoir beyond static gravity densification caused strat thermal stratifications. Sixth, what about horizontal wells to improve efficiency? For a reservoir of 100 meters thickness and injection all along the height of the reservoir, horizontal wells would likely not be advantageous. 
However, in reality, it may be difficult to find a reservoir of this thickness. And the reservoir storage container may be composed of several thinner layers separated by lower permeability rock. For such a case, short horizontal well segments be helpful to avoid higher injection pressure and lower production pressure drawdowns. And seventh, could fractured rock formations work instead of a more homogeneous permeability high porosity formation? There is a large difference, a really big difference, between a fractured reservoir with one or two percent porosity, all in the fractures, versus a homogeneous porosity reservoir of 10 to 20 percent porosity. The low porosity fractured formation reservoir will have a much, much larger rock matrix mass or the same water storage volume capacity. Obviously, the larger rock matrix mass will require much longer to thermally charge, simply a lot more rock to be heated. The heat would be to a large extent be stored in the rock and heat to or from the rock would be con conducted into the and out of uh, the rock into the water. This would tend to be a slow process because of the low thermal conductivity of rock. This would require a large fracture surface area and this large fluid circulation in the rock. Having noted these concerns, I believe the answer is maybe. But clearly, the advantages of the high porosity and high permeability formations would be lost. I mentioned earlier that I would not discuss surface facilities at this presentation. However, there is one thing I want to note. Kevin Kritz, as I previously noted, provided a very good presentation at the National Science Foundation workshop that is referenced on the second slide and also at the top of this slide. He reviewed surface facilities for reservoir thermal energy storage for electricity generation. And he mentioned the present opportunity that exists. He suggested that the excess solar and wind electricity currently available with additional large amounts planned could be used for resistive heating of water on the surface. That is curtailed solar and wind electricity could be used now to heat the water instead of totally using solar parabolic collectors. This would offer a huge advantage by reducing or even eliminating, at least initially, the surface solar collector system. This is indeed an important opportunity for considering. Finally, in conclusion, the big finding from, from the work I show is that the right reservoir or the right reservoir, a high porosity, high permeability formation, nearly all of the injected heat can practically be recovered. This is very important for thermal for reservoir thermal energy storage because I noted earlier, subsurface sub thermal energy storage just isn't going to be economical unless one can recover nearly all of the heat injected. I note the DOE, Department of Energy, Energy Storage Grand Challenge Draft Roadmap 2020, which was just released a couple of weeks ago. Reservoir thermal energy storage is mentioned, it's on page 96, with the note that further support may be provided. Certainly, I believe the reservoir thermal energy storage should be considered. It looks most interesting to me. In closing, I want to read from a just released J.P. Morgan Annual Energy Paper 2020. Now, this is a pretty important document, I think. Uh, J.P. Morgan has done their annual energy paper for the last, uh, I believe, decade now. I'm going to quote just some of the highlights relative to the discussion here. The paper notes, and quoting, decarbonization proposals for the grid entail substantial overbuilding of wind and solar power with the goal of storing excess electricity generation. However, long-term utility scale energy storage the electrochemical batteries is an industry that is still in its infancy. 
a much larger storage build out will be needed to displace natural gas peaker plant generation. There are plenty of hockey stick forecasts for electrochemical battery deployment as there were for electric vehicles a decade ago and which turned out to be way too high. Quoting from them, some battery storage forecasts are likely to be too high as well. I have been suggesting this also. I want to note again as I close that I've not covered geochemistry issues and they are critical. They have not been forgotten, but time just didn't allow it here. Thank you all. And, and if there's any question in time, I'll, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Okay, first one says, does heat loss calculation include along the well bore or reservoir only? Uh, the heat loss uh, along the well bore uh, has not been uh, performed in detail. Indeed, the, the heat loss of the fluid going up the well bore when you're producing or down uh, is a separate study. And so that the heat loss is in our calculations is primarily at the interface between the over and underlying formations. Next question, how does one pump 250C into the reservoir? Uh, you, you know, Kevin Kretz's talk speaks to that. And so pumping high temperature is an issue. High temperature water is an issue. Current pumps are limited and that may be just above the range of current pumps, but that is an issue. There are engineering problems here to be solved. It would not be, will it not be a compressible fluid? No, it's not a compressible fluid in the sense that by keeping pressure on the water, we never reduce the pressure completely when it comes to the surface or is reheated. And of course, you have to have pressure on the water to keep it from boiling at that 250 degrees C, which is about 500 PSI. So, uh, next question, how long can the battery store the fluid? That's an interesting question because one of the advantages of the subsurface energy storage is long term. Dr. Flanger has run calculations looking at what happens if you heated the reservoir for like four months in the summertime, say, and then you let it set for several months, how much heat do you lose? I was surprised at how little heat, how little temperature the reservoir, uh, temperature change occurs in the reservoir over several months time. So that's a good question, but one of the strong advantages of the subsurface storage is the ability of long-term seasonal storage if desired. Said, ignoring capital costs, can you elaborate a bit more on the operating costs of the injection production versus energy sold? Uh, the, the Idaho paper, there's a paper presented at the uh, Geothermal Resource Council last October, almost a year ago now, <clears throat> that does speak to a levelized cost of, <clears throat> of electricity. But let me speak a little bit to the, the parasitic costs of lifting the cold water and then injecting or pumping down the hot water for the heat storage. These are real parasitic costs. But one could imagine that one is doing that when the sun shines. And so one might use a photovoltaic panels to provide the electricity for your pumps, which is not free, it's not a free lunch, but at least it changes that parasitic operation from an operating cost to more of a capital cost. And so one could envision that the parasitic cost could be minimized, if you will, or lifting the cold water and injecting the hot water uh, during the energy storage. Next question, what about scale deposition? That is a key issue. And as I mentioned before, geochemistry considerations can be a deal breaker, but more likely they will simply limit your pressures, temperatures, and cyclics to prevent scale deposition or dissolution of the reservoir rock. It's a very important issue. And clearly there wasn't time this morning to talk about that, but that is a, a real important must consideration. Next question, do changes in the homogeneity of the reservoir at the boundary between adjacent GB units can be modeled? <clears throat> Yes, in the, at least in the ideal models, here we can. And indeed, for real systems, assuming that the units would be 
reasonably close together in order to prevent uh, extensive surface piping, then one would have to model how close can they be together without getting well-to-well -well pressure interferences. So the answer is, can they be modeled? Yes, it's a matter of computer time, computer capacity, and they would need to be modeled in any real system because again, I repeat, the units would need to be as close together as possible to minimize the surface piping. Uh, the next, next question, referring to the above question, do several units, can they be considered singly or together? I think for, for studying phenomena, as I've discussed here, the single well injection, the single well production works well for understanding phenomena as I've spoken of today. For any real system, one obviously has to modify multiple well systems to, to look at the interactional potential interaction well to well. Next question, were, different, were differences between laterally open reservoir versus compartmentalized reservoir models to com compare the energy loss? Kind of, kind of. See, because the storage volume, because, because the rock mass volume is quite small for large storage, it's reasonable to expect that one would stay away from compartmentalized when you're talking of scales of tens of meters, not kilometers. But indeed, a layered formation with layer interfaces that are low permeability would be a problem, and that's where the horizontal drilling may come in. So the question is, were difference between laterally open reservoir versus compartmentalization models, kind of, and there is a paper underway now by Dr. Flanagan uh, working at the, the compartmentalization due to permeability change. Uh, could we have the recorded volume? That's up to Richard. Do you want to, I'll let you comment on that one. There's one more. Was there some experimental results published are still on the simulation phase? What I presented has been calculations, not experimental. And I think where the laboratory experimental come into play is particularly on the geochemistry side. We start looking at scaling issues and uh, dissolution of the rock. There'll be experimental. From the from the larger scale, the next step would be a field demonstration, not a pilot plant, but a field demonstration to validate the, the calculations. To add this to the answer, the 250 water, is that the injection wells, is that the injection wells are on the surface? This is 250C to be heated on the surface. Obviously, the water would have to be under pressure to prevent boiling, and then it's injected as a liquid. So the pump can be set on either the cold fluid. The, the, the unit I showed suggests cold wells, which always are cold, and hot wells, which are always hot, but we do maintain the water at some pressure on the surface. So far, the production, however, the water well, conversion of, of that steam and hot water to electricity would be done in a conventional geothermal plant. Okay, I'll read. Yes, the, the, the comment goes on to say the conversion of the steam and hot water to electricity would be done in a conventional geothermal power plant. Yes, that's correct. We would use conventional surface equipment similar to any geothermal reservoir at this temperature. And, and Richard, I think that's all the questions I see. And they were amazingly easy. Thank you all for not asking more difficult questions. <laughs> Sid, do you have any closing thoughts, please? Richard, can I add a comment about uh, just about the, the subsurface storage and utilization community that you're, you're creating? Uh, certainly, I think it's great that you've decided to take that on and to create this community. Uh, when I look at, at particularly energy storage and other utilization, uh, subsurface utilization, such as carbon sequester, which is not a storage, you're putting it away permanently, ideally. I think the subsurface storage utilization is really an important topic right now. And when we go to, to use the subsurface, the investment community, the bankers who fund the projects, multi-billion dollar projects, subsurface is scary. 
You know, I, 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 I've noticed that in the financial community, they would much prefer to fund a big uh, uh, chemical, electrochemical battery on the surface that you could see, you know where it is. When you talk of let's do something in the subsurface, that's more complicated. And so I think your willingness, Richard, to take on this as a subsurface storage and utilization committee is very worthy of doing because it is the subsurface that we need to understand. Well, this concludes our webinar today. We wanted to thank everyone for participating and we'll see you next Wednesday.